There's something electric in the air as I flip through Tom's case files. As a neurologist, I've seen a variety of sleep disorders, but Tom's case, it's different. Sleep paralysis, accompanied by horrifying visions of nightmarish creatures that terrify him beyond reason. My mind is already filling with possibilities and questions. I sit across from Tom in the consultation room. His face is pale and drawn. He's exhausted, I can tell. Dark circles ring his eyes, and his shoulders slump as if carrying an unbearable weight. They're real, he says, his voice barely a whisper, his gaze distant and unfocused. They're not just hallucinations, they're real and they're terrifying. I lean back in my chair, studying him. As a scientist, I'm trained to view everything with a rational mind, to look for plausible explanations. Hallucinations due to sleep paralysis, common. But the terror in Tom's eyes, that's not just common, it's hauntingly real. Tom, I start, my voice steady despite the chill running down my spine. I understand that you're scared. Your brain can create vivid and sometimes terrifying images during sleep paralysis. It's quite common and it's not necessarily indicative of anything. But they touch me, Tom interjects, desperation edging his voice. His eyes are wide, the white stark against his sallow skin. I can feel them, their cold fingers, their heart breath. They're real. I pause, the weight of his fear tangible in the room. This isn't the typical fear I've seen with sleep paralysis patients. This is something deeper, something more profound. And it strikes me, that I can't just dismiss this. Tom is suffering, and it's my job, my duty, to help him. All right, Tom, I say, determination creeping into my voice. We're going to figure this out. I'll need to conduct some in-depth studies, observe your sleep patterns, and try to get a grasp on what we're seeing. Tom looks at me, his fear momentarily replaced with relief. Thank you, Emma, he breathes, slumping back in his chair. As I make preparations for Tom's overnight sleep study, I can't help but feel a mix of anticipation and unease. I guide Tom to the observation room. Are you comfortable, Tom? I ask, adjusting the nodes on his skull, designed to track his neural pathways as he transitions between sleep stages. As comfortable as I can be given the circumstances, he answers with a wry smile, his eyes betraying the fear that lingers. I give him a reassuring smile before leaving him. On the monitor, I watch as Tom lies motionless on the bed. As I settle into the night, my eyes dart between the computer screen, displaying real-time analysis of Tom's brain waves and the live feed of Tom himself. His eyes are shut, and his breathing is steady and deep. On the monitor, I notice a sudden spike in his REM activity, a clear indication of him entering into a dream state. His peaceful expression starts to contort, a sheen of sweat appearing on his forehead. I lean forward, watching as he starts to twitch, his eyes darting rapidly beneath closed lids. He's in it now, the terror-filled dreamscape he's described. An involuntary shiver runs down my spine as I see his heart rate increase, his breaths coming out shallow and fast. His body is rigid, stuck in the grips of sleep paralysis. Suddenly, I notice something odd on the screen displaying the live feed from his room. A strange, shimmering distortion appears, like a heat haze over a road on a hot summer day. It doesn't make sense. The room is air-conditioned. I blink, trying to shake off a late-night fatigue, but the odd distortion remains, growing more pronounced. My heart skips a beat as I notice the distortion merging into a shape. It's indistinct and shifting, but it sends a jolt of icy fear down my spine. The shape seems to hover over Tom, matching his fearful whispers about the creatures that visit him during his episodes. Despite my logical mind shouting that it's impossible, the evidence is right there in front of my eyes. On the computer screen, Tom's brain activity is going haywire, indicating his intense fear. The distortion above Tom shimmers and shifts, an unnerving spectacle I can't pull my eyes away from. On the computer screen, Tom's brain waves spike in an alarming pattern. A glance at the heart rate monitor shows his pulse racing. His body, rigid under the paralysis, is betraying the sheer terror coursing through him. Suddenly, he lets out a choked gasp, his body convulsing as if in a struggle with the shifting form above him. 
the electrodes connected to his scalp start to peel away due to his erratic movement. Stay away, I hear him whisper, his voice echoing through the intercom, desperate and filled with dread. Despite my own mounting fear, I rush into the room, ready to intervene if necessary. As I approach him, the distortion over Tom starts to dissipate, like fog clearing in the sunlight. I press a hand against his forehead, speaking in the most calming tone and I can manage. Tom, you're safe. It's just a dream. Try to wake up. But he's unresponsive, trapped in his nightmarish world. My fear intensifies, not for myself, but for Tom who's locked in this terrifying grip of sleep paralysis. I feel utterly helpless. After what feels like an eternity, his violent thrashing slows, and he sinks back onto the bed, his body relaxing. The horrifying form vanishes completely, leaving us in an unnerving silence. Returning to the control room, I watch as Tom's brainwaves slowly normalize, and his rapid heart rate eases back into a steady rhythm. He's come out of the paralysis, the immediate danger has passed, but his rapid, shallow breaths and the haunted look in his eyes when he finally opens them are clear indications of his trauma. The rest of the night passes uneventfully, but the images of the terrifying shape and Tom's distress are burned deeply into my mind. The study has unveiled a reality far darker and more terrifying than I had anticipated. As I enter the consultation room the next morning, Tom is already seated, and a cup of coffee is clutched in his trembling hands. His eyes, red-rimmed and hollow, look up at me. They're asking a question he can't voice. Good morning, Tom. I greet him, forcing a warm smile onto my face. I take the seat opposite him, crossing my legs and clasping my hands together on my lap. How are you feeling? Like I've been hit by a truck, he says with a weak smile. Did you see them? The question hits me like a cold wave. I consider lying, consider assuring him it was just a dream. But I owe him the truth. I saw something unusual. I start cautiously, an anomaly we can't explain yet. I assure you we're doing everything we can to figure out what's happening. A flash of fear crosses his face, quickly replaced by a grim acceptance. I told you they were real, he murmurs, dropping his gaze to the cup in his hands. Yes, you did, I reply, feeling a pang of guilt. Tom, I'm sorry I didn't believe you before, but I assure you I'm committed to finding a solution to this. His eyes meet mine again, this time filled with gratitude. Thank you, he says, his voice choked. It means a lot to me. The rest of our conversation revolves around the technical aspects of his sleep paralysis. We discuss the nature of REM sleep, the physiological effects of sleep paralysis, and possible treatment options. That night, as I drift off, I find myself in a dream where I'm trapped in an endlessly dark maze. The air is damp and heavy, pressing against my skin like a weight. The silence is oppressive interrupted only by my shallow, packed breaths. The maze stretches out in every direction, winding passageways leading deeper into the darkness. A faint light flickers in my hand, an old-fashioned oil lamp, its feeble glow barely penetrating the thick darkness around me. I begin to navigate the labyrinth, the cold stone walls brushing against my fingertips. Every turn, every twist and bend, only leads to more passages and more walls. I can't shake off the feeling that I'm being watched, a prickle at the back of my neck that makes me constantly turn, expecting to see something or someone. When I finally gather the courage to look behind me, I see it. A vague silhouette at the edge of the lamplight, its form shifting like a wisp of smoke. It's tall and daunting, an unformed terror that sends a bolt of raw fear down my spine. I start to run and my heart pounds in sync with my steps, echoing off the stone walls. I can hear it behind me, a rustle like fabric against stone, growing louder, closer. My breaths come out in ragged pants, my legs aching from exertion and fear. But no matter how fast or far I run, it's always there, just a few paces behind me. Suddenly, I hit a dead end. I whirl around, the lamp shaking in my trembling hands. The figure is closer now, its dark form consuming the faint glow of the lamp. The oppressive silence is broken by a low whisper, the sound as cold as the stone walls surrounding me. I can't discern the words, but the malice in the voice is unmistakable. 
I wake up with a start, the sound of the cold whisper fading into the silence of my bedroom. My heart races in my chest as if I've truly been running, and my skin is clammy with cold sweat. The image of the shadowy figure and its menacing whisper hangs heavy in the air, making the darkness of my bedroom feel oppressive and threatening. As I struggle to calm my racing heart, the reality of the dream hits me. The terror I felt was not unlike what Tom must experience during his episodes. A few days later, Tom's brain scans are spread across the desk in front of me. My eyes scan the lines and peaks, cross-referencing them with notes on my laptop. Suddenly, a movement at the periphery of my sight startles me. I jerk my head up, eyes squinting at the bright fluorescent lights of my office. I see it then at the doorway, a figure, its form is a brief, black silhouette that disappears as quickly as it appeared. I shoot up from my chair, knocking it back. My heart pounding in my chest, I rush to the doorway. The whole way outside is quiet, the pale hospital lights are casting long shadows, but none belong to the figure I saw. I move down the corridor and my eyes scan the empty stretch, but there's nothing. The only sound is the distant hum of the air conditioning, and my own heart beat in my ears. The absence of the figure does nothing to dispel the unease coiling in my stomach. I return to my office. The rest of the day is a battle with my own apprehension. I find myself glancing at every corner and every shadow. As I head to the hospital's underground parking lot later that evening, my nerves are on edge. The cold fluorescent lights cast harsh shadows between the cars and the concrete pillars. As I approach my car, I see it again. A figure leaning against the concrete pillar next to my car. My heart freezes in my chest and I stop. It's there one second, an impossibly tall, dark figure, and gone the next. It's as if it has merged with the shadows and disappeared into the night itself. I rush to my car, throwing a glance over my shoulder. The parking lot is empty, the silence broken only by the sound of my heels against the concrete. As I drive out, the rearview mirror shows an empty parking lot, but the feeling of being watched clings to me. The visions start to become more frequent. During a lunch break at the hospital cafeteria, I spot an eerie shadow out of the corner of my eye. It hovers at the edge of the crowded room. I blink, and it's gone. One evening, as I'm driving home, a shadow darts across my rearview mirror. Startled, I swerve, narrowly missing the curb. I stop the car. When I look again, there's nothing but the empty road bathed in the orange glow of the setting sun. Night after night, the dreams return. Each time, the maze is darker and the figure is closer. Each day, the shadows seem more real, the visions more frequent. They're no longer confined to my dreams, seeping into my waking hours, tainting every moment with a sense of impending doom. I start to dread sleep. The fear that used to be Tom's is now mine as well. The line between my nightmares and reality blurs, leaving me in a constant state of unease. I feel like I'm being watched and hunted by something lurking just beyond my line of sight. As the shadows grow bolder and the dreams more terrifying, I'm forced to confront the reality that what's happening to Tom is now happening to me. The creatures that have been haunting the periphery of my vision, the ones that lurk in the shadowy corners of my dreams, are becoming more distinct and more real. The line between reality and the nightmare is not just blurring, it's dissolving. As I sit at my desk, poring over medical journals and research papers, I can't shake off the feeling of being watched. It's as though the creatures from Tom's dreams and from my dreams have infiltrated my waking life. Desperate for answers, I dive into the research on shared psychosis, the phenomenon where two people share a delusion, a breakdown in reality. The question is, could the terror that Tom experiences during his sleep paralysis episodes be so strong and so vivid that it's inducing a similar response in me? Pulling up my search browser, I type in the phrase. A slew of scholarly articles, case studies, and medical definitions fill the screen. I dive in, my mind already churning with questions. Shared psychotic disorder, one article starts is a rare condition in which an individual shares delusions with another person, typically a close relative or friend. Close relative or friend. I've always been professional with Tom, 
maintaining a patient-doctor relationship, but the line seems to have blurred somewhere along the way. This fear has become my fear, is nightmare my reality? Is this closeness, this shared experience, the cause of my unraveling sanity? As I delve deeper into the research, I find that shared psychosis often occurs where the two individuals live in proximity. We don't live together, but I've been immersed in his case for weeks now. Could the intensity of this professional relationship simulate the proximity described in these studies? I read on about treatment methods and ways to cope. Therapy, counseling, distancing oneself from the person with the delusion. It's not as simple as taking a pill and making it go away. This is a psychological condition rooted deeply in the subconscious, and it requires intense intervention. One particular study catches my attention. A case of a therapist who started experiencing the same phobias as her patient. She saw spiders crawling on her body and felt them in her hair. It got so intense that she had to be hospitalized. The only thing that helped was discontinuing her sessions with the patient and seeking help. The parallels with my own situation sent a chill down my spine. I rubbed my temples, trying to stave off a creeping panic. Is this my future? Hospitalization? A complete mental breakdown? My search leads me to my colleague, Dr. Alvarez, a seasoned psychiatrist with decades of experience under his belt. He's a gruff, no-nonsense man, but he's also one of the best in his field. Emma, he greets me as I enter his office, a small smile on his face. To what do I have the pleasure? I need your opinion, I confess, feeling a pang of vulnerability. I've been working on a sleep paralysis case. The patient experiences intense hallucinations during his episodes, terrifying creatures that chase him. Alvarez leans back in his chair, listening attentively. And you think these hallucinations are real? Not real. I shake my head, choosing my words carefully, but possibly contagious. The look on his face is one of intrigue and skepticism. Contagious. Emma, hallucinations aren't a common cold. They can't just be caught by the people around. I know, I know, I say quickly, but I started seeing things. Creatures similar to what he describes. It's like they're invading my dreams and seeping into my waking hours. There's a long pause as Alvarez studies me, his eyes narrowing slightly. Shared psychosis, he mutters eventually. You think you're experiencing his symptoms through exposure? I nod, feeling a glimmer of hope. Is it possible? He sighs deeply, running a hand through his thinning hair. It's rare, but not unheard of. Usually, it occurs in people who are in close proximity for extended periods. But Emma, he leans forward, it's serious. If you're experiencing shared psychosis, it means your mental state is compromised. I swallow hard, my mouth suddenly dry. What shall I do? Distance yourself from the patient and seek help. Therapy, counseling, whatever it takes, he advises sternly. His words hang heavy in the room. I know he's right, I need help. But I can't just abandon Tom. Not when I might be the only one who can truly understand what he's going through. It's the late hours of the night when I find myself sitting at my desk again. Alvarez's warning plays in my mind, but so does Tom's fear. I stumble upon an article about a forgotten tribe nestled deep in the Amazon rainforest that believed in entities from a dream world. The Yakuna tribe, as the article describes, was a small Amazonian tribe lost to history due to modern encroachment and disease. Their beliefs, however, have been preserved in written accounts by explorers and anthropologists who visited them in the early 20th century. One unique aspect of their belief system is the concept of the dream world, a parallel reality inhabited by entities unseen in our waking world. These entities, described as ethereal, often monstrous creatures, held dominion over the dream world. According to the Yakuna, certain individuals were gifted, or cursed, with the ability to perceive this dream world in their sleep. They called these individuals dream seers. Dream seers were often identified early in life, their affliction marked by unusual sleep patterns, vivid nightmares, and episodes of sleep paralysis. Strikingly, their experiences mirror modern descriptions of sleep paralysis, with the perceived presence 
of threatening creatures a common theme. The article dives into the mechanics of this transference, as understood by the Akuna. They believed that during periods of sleep paralysis, the veil between our world and the dream world thins, allowing entities to cross over. This, they suggested, explained the vivid, often terrifying visions dream seers experienced. Importantly, they believed that these entities could, under certain circumstances, extend their influence into the waking world. Manifestations ranged from fleeting shadows to more substantial apparitions. The more a dream seer interacted with an entity in their dreams, the stronger its presence would become in reality. The article ends with a cautionary note. While the Yakuna beliefs are fascinating, they remind us of the power of the mind in shaping our perceptions of reality. Whether or not one chooses to believe in literal dream world, the experiences of the dream seers underscore the mystery and complexity of the human brain and the reality shaping power of our subconscious fears and beliefs. I sit back in my chair stunned. The correlation between the tribe's dream seers and Tom's condition is eerily similar. Could Tom be a modern day dream seer, a bridge between two realities? Are the creatures he sees not hallucinations but actual entities from this dream world? I share my findings with Dr. Alvarez the next day. His office is cluttered with books and patient files, a testament to the years of service he's given to the field of psychiatry. Emma, he says, squinting at the article I handed him. This is interesting, but it's also dangerous. I know, I nod, gripping the edge of the chair. But what if it's true? What if Tom isn't just hallucinating, but actually seeing these creatures? He rubs his temples, setting the article down. And you've been seeing them too. Yes, I confess, my voice barely a whisper. And they're getting more vivid, more real. There's a long silence, Alvarez staring at the article with a pensive look. Emma, I've seen a lot in my years of practice. But this, this is new territory. These beliefs, they're old, perhaps forgotten for a reason. You're playing the fire here. But what if there's a way to help Tom? I insist. What if understanding these entities, this dream world, is the key? Alvarez sighs, leaning back in his chair. Emma, you need to take care of yourself first. I can't stress this enough. You're heading down a dangerous path. I nod, although his words feel distant, muffled by the surge of adrenaline coursing through me. The knowledge about the Yakuna tribe and their dream seers hangs heavy in my mind. I decide to set up an overnight study for both Tom and me in the lab. If the creatures from the dream world can cross over into our reality, maybe our brain activity will provide evidence of this crossover. We're in the lab, the hum of the machinery echoing around us. Tom looks at me, his eyes filled with fear and apprehension, but also a dimmer of hope. Ready, Tom? I ask, my voice steady despite the racing heartbeat. As ready as I'll ever be, he replies, his lips tugging into a grim smile. In the darkness, lying on the reclining chairs, I watch Tom's face relax into sleep, his breaths evening out. My own eyes feel heavy, the strain of the past weeks catching up with me. And before I know it, I'm slipping into the hazy world of dreams. A shrill beep jolts me awake. I blink, taking a moment to register my surroundings. The monitors display a collection of spikes, both Tom's and mine, indicating a sudden surge in brain activity in sync with the increasing sound of the beeps. I turn my head towards Tom. Around him, shrouded in an ethereal glow, are the entities. They are terrifying, just as Tom described them, grotesque, shadowy figures, flickering like a distorted static image. But they are real, not mere figments of imagination. They exist in our world, in our reality. Despite the fear of gripping me, I continue to watch. I glance back at the monitors, the lines jumping erratically. Our brainwaves, though not identical, follow a similar pattern. It seems that our brains are reacting to the same stimuli, the entities, providing the first tangible proof of our shared experience. As the experiment progresses, the entities continue to linger. They do not interact with the physical environment, nor do they seem to notice me observing them. Their attention is solely focused on Tom, who is trapped in his own sleep paralysis. Every once in a while, 
I notice Tom's body twitch, his breath hitching as he enters deeper into his episode. His heart rate spikes along with these movements, reflected in a frantic beeping of the machine. Despite the eerie silence in the room, I can almost feel a sort of energy radiating from the entities, cold and imposing. It's as if the very air in the room has thickened, charged with the strange otherworldliness they bring with them. I glance over at the clock. Hours have passed, but it feels like mere minutes in this surreal experience. The entities start to fade as dawn approaches, their forms growing less solid, more like wisps of smoke. Just as the first rays of sunlight peek through the blinds of the lab, they disappear entirely, leaving no trace of their presence. Tom's body relaxes, his breathing evening out as he drifts into a deeper, undisturbed sleep. The lines on the monitor return to a normal pattern, the spike in our brain activity subsiding simultaneously. I sit there in the dim morning light, my mind racing to process what I've just witnessed. After the experiment, life settles into a new kind of normal. I continue to see the entities, their appearances are now less startling, their presence a constant reminder of the thread connecting our worlds to the dream world. My research veers in a direction I never anticipated, threading the line between the concrete and the supernatural. I dig deeper into the Akuna tribe's ancient knowledge, my Western-trained mind grappling with their spiritual wisdom. The theory of the dream seers no longer seems fantastical, but a path to understanding. Tom becomes an active partner in my research. His sleep paralysis episodes continue, but with the medications and therapy, he learns to manage his fear better. He no longer feels alone or crazy. There's a shared sense of purpose between us, a drive to unravel the mystery of the entities, and begin to attract attention from the scientific community. Some dismiss our research as pseudoscience, while others express cautious interest. Several patients with similar experiences reach out, and their stories add more pieces to the puzzle. But as the days roll into weeks and then months, I realize something crucial. We may never find a definitive cure. This phenomenon, this intertwining of two worlds, may not be a condition to cure, but a reality to understand and navigate. So we can better understand what this is, and how we can handle it.